Greetings and welcome to the session. My name is Zach, I'm an artist and an art teacher. The footage here is from my last session, except now I get the fun task of painting these little guys in with watercolor. One of my oldest loves when it comes to the art world. I've been using this one for a long time. In fact, I started making art when I was just a little kid. And it's kind of interesting now being a little bit older and having my own little kid around when I'm making art. In my brain, I've got these fantasies about sitting down with my daughter and her working on her project and me working on my project and we mystically and miraculously finish our projects at the same time and we show them to each other or we run off to my wife and we brag about the things that we made. Or maybe I've got this idea of putting a massive canvas on the wall or an old refrigerator box, and my daughter and I together, we paint or recover this whole thing. And I think that there will be a moment when I get to that level, but at this point, she's four. And so mostly I sit down to work on something, she sits down to work on something, and 90 seconds later, she starts making marks on my page and I have to kind of kindly remind her that that's not particularly appropriate, just like I've reminded her not to take my spoon when we're eating because she has her own utensils. Maybe those are just little things that kind of mess with me, but um, yeah, it's an interesting thing making art with a little kid around. And my daughter, like so many kids, loves to make things. She loves to create things. And what I found is that it gives me an excuse to spend time with her. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And as an art teacher, somebody who has a background in child psychology, especially when it comes to the schemas and how we learn how to interpret visual data, I try to be really, really careful about talking to her about what she's making. If she sits down and she starts painting or drawing something, the human temptation is to ask, well, tell me, like, what are you making? Tell me about what you're making. Is that a plane? Is that a frog? Are these arms on that figure? Why is the head attached to the legs and there's no torso? That's really, really normal for people to do, but it's actually not a great way to approach it. Children, like all of us did, start to interpret the world in layers. There's a reason that their first drawings of themselves are usually just a circle with a couple features and maybe arms and legs coming off of them. That is their initial schema. Their understanding that the head is where they look, it's what they interact with the most, it's where their eyes are located, it's where they speak, it's the most important part of their body. They don't really put a lot of emphasis or importance on other parts. Now the hands and feet are important obviously because that's mobility and interacting with the world around them. But in general, the schema for most children when they start painting or drawing just involves the head. And usually you'll notice in little kids, the drawings that they make of themselves are usually titanic in comparison with other people because at a young age, they're the most important people, person in their life. And that makes sense, right? Um, we're all born pretty selfish. You don't have to teach a human how to be selfish. They just, they come with that innately. Some of us grow out of it. Some of us have to work on it. But that's a really interesting thing. And so when you have a child in your vicinity who is starting to draw or paint, or develop their visual language and ideas, it's a wiser way to interact with them to just ask them to tell you about what they're working on. So I'll often sit down and my daughter will very obviously be drawing a tree or a person. And instead of telling her, you know, what she can fix on it or pointing out things that are not necessarily correct, or even just, you know, suggesting what I think it is, it's better to just ask her like, hey, tell me about this. Tell me, are you making something? Or are you just playing? And let her take the reins on describing things. Because sometimes I think she's drawing something. I think she's painting a specific thing and she's not. She's just playing with the crayons and the markers. And that's totally fine. What we've noticed and studies have yielded this as well is when you ask a kid to define what they're doing, Often, if they didn't have a definition, they will create one and fabricate one in that moment and it will start to change what they're doing. And that's not a terrible, terrible thing, but it can be the first pieces and signs of pointing them in a direction and not allowing them to just do what they need to do. It's a very like Montessori way of educating children, which is not necessarily what I'm advocating for in all counts. I worked in a classical school where things were exceedingly rigorous and predetermined as far as how we taught most subjects, including art. But 
for little children, the act of playing with the art medium, the act of just learning how they interact with it and how they want to interact with it is exceedingly, exceedingly important. And so just a wise note from years of experience working with little ones and from some childhood psychology background, ask them to tell you about what they're doing and don't force them to define it. At a very young age, they don't need to. And sometimes when they get older, you can start asking questions, you know, hey, what are you working on here? Hey, I, I drew myself, don't I look awesome? You know, and then you can look at the drawing and realize that there's no neck and you could ask them about that, but I would wait until they're a little bit older, usually about five or six, you can start asking questions to clarify those kind of things. There are tiny little areas like that that I've started asking her questions about, or I'll draw something and I'll ask her to tell me what I need to include next. Okay, I'm drawing myself. You know, and pretty much she tells me I just need to have the beard. Like that's what makes a drawing daddy is it's a beard and a drawing is her if it's got a very curly head of hair on it because she has very, very curly hair. So um, yeah, it's a really interesting thing to make art with the kids around and with little ones around. I also think that making it when you have kids or if you're babysitting or you're watching anybody, it's a good thing for them to see that adults do because we as a culture have often told kids that art is just a kiddish thing, it's a childish thing. And so if you make art around your kids or when you're watching other people's kids or if you have some other people's kids over to your house and you can show them your studio space or your sketchbooks, it's encouraging. It's good for them to know that adults and that people in their life that they value and they, they look up to make things and create things. Because pretty much everything cool in this pl on this planet was made or created by something. I mean, if you're gonna go into like the nature stuff, you know, you could look at that being, from a religious standpoint, it's been made by a creator of some kind. From an evolutionary standpoint, it's withstood the test of time. But all of the cool things that humans have built and created were designed by someone with creativity, designed by an artist, designed by an engineer, de designed by a craftsman. So many cool things. And so I think it's important that kids grow up understanding not only is it good to create, to make, to have ideas, to explore your imagination, but it actually might be one of the best ways to tap into your humanity and to be the best human that you can be. And so to that end, I try to take a little bit of time every week and spend time drawing and painting with my daughter. It was just Mother's Day, so we made some nice, lovely projects for her, um, her two grandparents or her two grandmas, and uh, for my wife as well. And that was a good opportunity for me to sit down with my girl and to make things and to make things alongside her and help her make things. And I'm a little bit of a perfectionist sometimes, like none of you are, I'm sure. And so I have to resist helping her make her, her things more perfect because they don't have to be. There's some beauty and the little four-year-old's sculpture being all wonky because it's it's a testament to who she is and who she was at that moment and we're going to look back on it years from now and the the imperfections are love the imperfections are a reflection of her and who she was at that moment um but i try to take that time and and to that end she has a little desk behind me in my studio and she doesn't use it all the time. And as my studio grows and expands, she will have her own corner of it that is always open and welcome to her. And she loves coming in here. Um, it's hard for me to get any work done when she's doing that because you know she wants me to see everything she's doing. But as she grows, as her attention span expands, then you know she will uh, she'll be able to hang out with me while I'm working on things, while I'm making a painting. And so she has her own little studio space. And on that train of thought, do you have a studio space? Do you have a safe and comfortable place to make your art? For years, I just did my art on the couch or on the dining room table. And that's fine. And that's fine, especially if that's all you have access to. But I now have an actual studio. At some point, I might show you guys what it all looks like. I just mostly, I, when it comes to that, I look around and go, ah, it's so cluttered and dirty and there's stuff everywhere because I organize it and then I get excited about something and all the organization goes right out the window. But I do now have a space that is safe. It is comfortable for me to make art. And I, I emphasize safe because especially if you're young and especially if you use your sketchbooks to work through any kind of stuff you're going through in life, 
it's important for you to have space that you can work on your art where you don't feel like you're gonna be critiqued every moment, where you don't feel like you're gonna have somebody peering over your shoulder and you're not gonna be self-conscious about what you're working on. That's an important thing. But let's start with the space that is comfortable to make your art. And I think one of the most important things, and even if you live in a tiny apartment or you just have a bedroom because you're a teenager, one of the best parts is just you can have your art supplies out and you don't have to sit down and spend 10 or 15 minutes getting everything ready to go. So one of the best things that I think all of us should strive for is having just a little corner somewhere that has our pencils ready to go, our inks ready to go, our watercolors ready to go, like this fun little goofy guys that I'm working on in the background right now. I have a, a collapsible set of watercolors that I've had for a couple years now. I think that I bought on Amazon and just some random stray brushes and I just fill up a ball jar with uh, water and I can be ready to paint in two minutes max maybe even less if I if I've got water just hanging out somewhere in the studio I can just pour it in and I'm ready to go and that eases the point of entry for me it's a it's a nice place where if I have 10 minutes and I just want to make something real quick I can do that and I, I'm going to be able to utilize almost 10 of those minutes so I would highly encourage all of you to just make sure you have a place set up somewhere, a place where you can make things whenever the desire hits you, whenever your whims point you towards, you know, just engaging with whatever the muse is throwing your way that day. And the safe part is important too. I think it's important to have a door that closes on your studio. Um, not that you need to work on things that are inappropriate or things that you don't want other people seeing uh, because they're inappropriate, but there is something to be said for, you don't want people necessarily looking at your, your in-progress stuff. A lot of my sketches or initial layers on a painting kind of suck. And I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not often self-conscious about things, but art I'm more self-conscious about than, than most everything else in my life. And I don't like anyone coming in and looking over my shoulder and you're like hey like that, that that's looking good it's like no it's not i know it's not looking good don't patronize me <laughs> don't don't degrade me by assuming that your like your kindness means anything in this moment i know it looks like crap i just started um i don't like that stress and i know a lot of people don't either and so having a place that is safe that you can retreat to to make things it's a really wonderful thing. So I would encourage you, try to find a space to do that. You know, even if that space can't be in your home, if you've got to go to a library or um, somewhere at school where you can kind of be in a corner and work on stuff and just shove on your headphones and not be bothered by anything. It's a really wonderful thing. But if it can be in your home, that's even better, I think, because then you can actually have your supplies out and you can have things ready to go at a moment's notice. But you know what? You can survive as an artist for years with nothing but a sketchbook. I certainly have, and I know many, many, many others that have done the same. And uh, sketchbooks are such a wonderful, wonderful tool. On the same train of thought, especially when it comes to safety, I think it's important to have people in your life that are safe to talk to about your art. Now, hopefully you've been blessed with an art teacher that you're capable of going to and talking through your creations, your ideas, your imagination, but not all of us have that. And many of us have to rely on our friends and maybe some of us can rely on parents as well. Either way, it's important to have people in your life that are safe to talk to about your art and about life because art and life are fundamentally linked. It's very difficult, I'm sure you found as well, to create art when like you're not in a great place. Sometimes art can be the tool that pulls you out of that, but art is often linked to your mental state. If things are a little chaotic in your life, in your mind, then your art often mirrors that. And conversely, sometimes your art is a haven. And so if life is chaotic, you're working on little things that are the opposite of chaotic because it helps pull you out of that. But it's almost always reflective of what's going on in your life. So having someone that you can confide in, someone that you can talk to about your artwork, the way you can get critiques on things, and simultaneously people that you can talk to about your life and what's going on, those things are all going to help you as a human being, and they're gonna help your art progress as well. 
I was fortunate enough in high school to always have at least one good teacher that I could talk to. My art teacher in high school was a fantastic woman and she took very good care of us and allowed us a lot of freedom to, um, maybe sometimes too much freedom, to listen to music and to make things and we had a coffee pot in her room and it was just a safe place for us to create things and think about things. And although we didn't have a ton of conversations with her where we confided in her about all the drama in our lives, what it provided was space for us as friends to discuss those things because it was comfortable and it was a good safe space. And so we confided in each other and we took care of each other. And even today, I always need people that I can talk to about artistic things. I've got my best friend from growing up who I often talk to about my artwork and who never ceases to give me phenomenal feedback when it comes to um, skills-based things, when it comes to imagination-based things. It always feels like when I ask him a question, the answer that he gives me back is like a key to unlock something that like, oh my goodness, I should have seen that, I should have known that. Kind of like when you talk to a counselor sometimes and they, they point something out, out to you and they help you make a connection, you're like, oh my goodness, I should have been able to do that yourself. But it's like, no, um, humans are built to be part of a community. And uh, look at this little snowball guy, the guy, I love him. He, he might be my favorite one on this page. He turned out so well. But we as humans are part of a community. We're built to be part of a community. And so we're not gonna figure everything out on our own. As much as I would love to, as much as I would love to be totally self-sufficient, it's not how it works. We learn things and we, we grow as human beings by talking to other people and by learning from them. So I, I can't overestimate and overemphasize how important it is to have people in your life artistically that you can confide in, people in your life that you can talk to, people in your life that can help you grow. Oh my goodness, so much benefit to pull from that. And indeed, life and art are just simply interconnected. And I don't know how much you can extricate the two from each other. Uh, I enjoy going back through some of my old sketchbooks and I've started to do some sketchbook tours on here. If for no other reason, because, well, there's two reasons primarily. One, it's interesting for me and enjoyable for me to go back and see like, who was I when I made these? And two, I want people to see that every artist starts at zero. You know, my work right now is not amazing but it's enjoyable. I have fun doing the things I'm doing. The guys you're seeing in the background, they're, they're enjoyable for me to put together. And so every artist starts from zero. And so seeing my sketchbooks, I think the first sketchbook tour I did on here was my sixth grade sketchbook, which is the, la the, the oldest one I have, which would have been 24 or 25 years ago, something like that. And I was a little kid at that point in time and my art was not good. And sharing that on the internet is a little awkward, but also like it's not, I don't feel like it's me. That's an old version of me that doesn't exist anymore, except that it's, that seed is cracked and grown and died and grown into the human being, the adult that I am now. And that's just, you know, it's just weird. It's weird sometimes to go back and see that. But I want people potentially to be encouraged by the fact that these old drawings are not good. And over the, the next dozen or so sketchbook tours where if you desire, you'll be able to see that growth, you'll be able to see that things do get better, but it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours of time invested into that process, into growing. And so it's, it's interesting to see those old drawings. And if you go back and look at yours as well, you're gonna notice pieces of who you were at that moment, what was going on in your life, and it's going to be reflected in your art. And if you're anything like me, you're gonna start pulling some of the nostalgia from those old things. When I find drawings that I made of old video game characters or uh, Pokemon, or which obviously are video game characters, or Dragon Ball Z stuff, um, man, I'm right back to being whatever age I was when I first fell in love with those things. And it's, it's so odd. And you gotta remember, I grew up in a world where cell phones were not common. I got my first cell phone when I was a sophomore in high school. Uh, and the only reason I got it is because my best friend turned 16 six months before me and I stopped coming home on time. <laughs> and so my parents needed a way to track me and know where I was. And so they got me a cell phone. Prior to that, 
you know, most people didn't have them. I don't, I think I was probably one of the first ones in my friend group to have one actually. And back then they couldn't text. You couldn't take photos with them or anything like that. So our documentation was not as good back then. I, my daughter is four years old now and we have like probably 20,000 photos from the time she was born until now, maybe more. Um, the reason I know that is because we have iPhones and on our phones it tells us how many fo photos we have. And I think right now it's like 49,000 photos, which is insane. But that, not, it's insane in so many levels. That Like that quantity of in visual information is just astronomically hard to wrap your head around. But, but, that didn't exist when I was a kid. And so a lot of times looking back at these sketchbooks, that's all the visual data I might have from a year. I can go find a picture of myself in the yearbook. Maybe my mom has some photos from my birthday that year or something. But there were often years where like there might have only been a dozen photos of me that entire year. Which is just mind blowing. Because there are people in my life now that take a dozen photos of their loved ones or themselves a day. And yet I've got these entire blocks of time where it's like the only visual information I have is this sketchbook that's 25 years old. So it's nostalgic and it's interesting to go back and to see like, who, who were I? Who were I? Rah! Who was I at this moment? What was I like? What was I into? What was exciting? This little onion guy's cute too. So, and the nostalgia is crazy when you go back and you find like your first anime drawing or your first video game drawing or when you were 14 years old and decided I'm going to make video games I'm going to design my own video game and you can you, you these things that you haven't thought about in ages you go back and you start looking at the drawings and you're like oh my goodness like I'm starting to remember things I'm starting to remember these pieces I'm remembering chunks of this book that I read because this is uh this is representative or represented in the art at that moment just such a yeah, such a strange thing. Art is so weird in how it binds us to this moment. It's something I used to talk about in the classroom a lot was that art is often a window into the civilizations that we look at. So why is art history important? Because it's it's seen as boring by a lot of people and sometimes it, it is, especially how it's taught. But art history is a window into the people groups because they didn't have photographs. And if you go back far enough, they didn't have writing systems or they did you know, but we don't have them. We don't have pieces of work that are representative of that. And the amphoras and the mosaics and the cave paintings give us some window into who those people were and what they valued and what they found important. And I'm finding that same thing in my sketchbooks. So I would encourage all of you, go back and find your oldest sketchbook that you have and record a video going through it and talking through the things. And don't feel any pressure to put that video anywhere, but I would highly encourage you to do that for posterity's sake, so it's saved. So if you get older and you forget the things that are in there, you uh, you have a record of that, and you can go back to it and you can look at it. It's um, It's been enjoyable and enlightening for me, and also humbling in a way. You know, every once in a while I feel like I'm this complete creature, this grown up, you know, who knows what he's doing and like, you know, it's good to get you know, smacked in the face by reality and realize you have no idea what you're doing. That, you know, especially artistically, I I can probably accomplish about 10% of what I want to. And going back and realizing that there was a point where I could accomplish 1% of what I wanted to and that I can keep growing and I and someday I might be able to accomplish 50% of what I want to. Those are, those are good things. Those are good things. I've been thinking lately about these conversations, these discussions, things that I ramble about while I'm doing my sketchbook sessions or recordings. And I find that I often, I feel like I'm tailoring the conversation towards people who want to have art as a career. And I think maybe that's because a lot of the stuff that I take in, a lot of the media that I absorb, that's part of the focus, especially here on YouTube. It seems like most people that are putting out content uh, concerning art and the art journey and art pursuits really are focused on art career. And it's made me step back a little bit and think like, is that, is that really the most important thing to focus on when it comes to art and the art journey? 
And does it have to be a career to be important or special? I think maybe here in the US, we tend to bind ourselves to career as being the most important thing in our lives and that which defines us. You know, especially since I got out of teaching, there's been a propensity for me to think about like, oh, what if they ask what I'm doing right now? And I ha like, do I have an answer for that? And I didn't before, you know, before it was just, oh yeah, like, you know, the school year is going fine. I'm not actively in the classroom right now. And so there's a little bit of like, oh goodness, like, who am I? What am I? But my pessimistic, <laughs> yeah, like humanistic approach to that was, you know, it has been, well, if I can't answer that question, if I don't feel comfortable answering that question because I'm, I'm not in the classroom right now and I don't have that anchor point, then I probably never had a good answer to begin with, right? You know, if you are a lawyer and that's how you identify yourself and that is what you are to society, you know, if you are a teacher and people ask, you know, questions about you and you, you tie everything into being a teacher, it means you never really had a good answer for that question, I think. Um, and I don't imagine everyone's going to agree with that, and that's fine. Like, we're, we're all different. We all, we all take things in a little bit differently. But I tend to think that your job is a portion of what you do. And if you can do something that you love for your occupation, wonderful. But that doesn't seem to be the case for most people. And so we as a community here put a lot of focus on that. In, the, in America, we put a huge focus on your career as being your identity or a major component of it. And so I think that there's a focus on, hey, you wanna pursue art? Like, well, you shouldn't pursue art because you can't make money doing it or because it's really hard to get in and, and make a career out of it or because it's brutal to do that. And I don't know that those things are necessarily incorrect. I do know that there are certainly people in my life that make full-time livings making art and producing art um and so those are those are fabricated you know you can you can absolutely make your living being an artist i, I know many but does it have to be your career to be legitimate because i think the reality of the reality is most people who are listening to this video uh, who are watching this, who are watching content like this on YouTube are not professionals and are not going to probably be professionals. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe most of the people listening will eventually get to some point. But does that mean that it was not legitimate the entire time you were working on it? No, I don't, I don't think so at all. I think that art is a human thing to do and it's only natural for us to desire to create things and to build things and to leave a legacy behind, to have something that exists in this world because we were born into it. And even if that doesn't end up being a career, it's still a worthwhile endeavor. Why do you garden? Well, I mean, yeah, you can get some vegetables that you couldn't get elsewhere, or maybe it's good to be outside, but the reality is like you could go to the store and probably for less time, hassle, and maybe even money, you can just purchase basil. You can purchase a tomato. You can get some potatoes. Um, especially things like lettuce and cabbage and celery that are notoriously difficult to grow at home and have them be restaurant or store quality. So why do people garden? Well, because there's profound joy to be found in being outside and watching things grow and shoving your fingers into the earth. And that's the same for art. Art has innate joy in it. And it doesn't have to be legitimized by a career or by making substantial money or any money doing it. It is a human thing to do. It's important to do. Our souls, our minds are nourished by the doing of it. And it doesn't need to be a career to be legitimate. It doesn't Conversely, that doesn't mean that if it is a career for you, that it's illegitimate for you because you're making money doing it. And there are people that say that, that art should only be made for art's sake. And that if you're making something for someone else, you're taking commissions, you're doing graphic design work where it's corporate, then it's no longer art. And that's stupid. Sorry, that's just dumb. 
it can't be that black and white. Very few things are in this world. So art is justifiable. It is justifiable for its own ends, its own means. It is an, a means to its own end. It is all of these things and it is complicated. But it doesn't need to be your career. It doesn't need to be your money-making avenue to be legitimate. And so if that's something that you're struggling with, something that you feel, you know, some difficulty with, try to give yourself some grace. Realize that it's legitimate to make it, even if it just brings you a little bit of joy. It's good for your brain. It can be a way to share things with your family, share things with your loved ones, with your kids, with your parents. How many parents don't love getting little things that were made by their kids and, and vice versa as well. It can give you the ability to work through things, traumas, difficult times in life, and it engages your mind. It helps you to slowly stave off aging, which is of course coming for all of us. But in the same capacity that people who struggle with dementia, Alzheimer's, or any of these things that happen as you get older, doing puzzles, engaging your mind, telling stories, reading books, all of these things are good for the human mind because it prevents stagnation. Art is not dissimilar. It's simply a pulling apart of things, a replicating of things, a reimagining of things. It is a puzzle, regardless of what you're working on. If you're painting, you're breaking down how light and color and pigment affect the human eye and the mind and how they replicate things and how you can use them to show things. If you're working on a drawing, you're taking something that is three-dimensional and putting it into two-dimensional space, often with only a single tone. That's difficult, that's problem solving, and it's good for the mind to do so. It's a good, healthy thing for kids to draw, for kids to paint. Painting maybe even more so. The watercolor that you're watching me do in the background here is more difficult than drawing in a lot of ways because here in the US, we don't spend a lot of time with brushes. And so it requires a different set of complicated skills. It requires our brains to function in a slightly different way. We spend so much time with pencils and yet we don't spend very much time with brushes. And so it requires different physical fine motor skills. It requires different thought processes. It requires more of our attention. And those things are good. Doing things that are challenging that don't come naturally to you, help you grow, help you become more you, help you become more full, help you be able to endure more difficult things in the future. You develop resilience by continuing to work on things that are difficult, that are hard. And so art can be this wonderful, crazy thing that gives you the ability to hone skills and develop skills and abilities that you wouldn't otherwise. It's engaging. It gives you the ability to learn new things. It's beautiful and crazy and frustrating and so very difficult and not for the faint of heart and yet for everyone. We're starting to get into rambly territory here, so it's probably best to wrap this up at this point. If you are still with me, if you're still listening, thank you so much for hanging out and for watching and listening to this sketchbook session. Um, I have fun making these. It's good for me to, to make the artwork. I just hope that some of these words are beneficial to you, that you enjoy uh, watching, that you enjoy listening to the rambles, that it helps you to work through things. If you like the video, please like the video. If you are enjoying seeing these, please subscribe if you haven't already. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we can use the support here at the channel in any way possible. So thank you so much. <sighs> All right. Have a good one, y'all. See you soon.